So we're going to be speaking about, funnily enough, it's about, you know, the good era. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying that I was inspired by that, but um, it's certainly very, very pretty, the good era. And so we're turning to the book of James here. And if we could turn to James 1 and look at verses 22. So, and if you can, you know, you're able to, we'll just stand for the reading of the Lord. Yeah. Bible here. We call ourselves Bible believers, so we tend to have Bibles right about. And, uh, you know, I'm really thankful that we come to this fellowship, that there's no shortage of Bibles about. You know, so have a good Bible that you can look through and go through the pages and, you know, and find yourself, get yourself orientated in the Bible and know where everything is. And it says here in first, uh, sorry, in James 1 and verse 22, it says, But be ye doers of the words. Everybody got it? Amen. Amen. Right. I'll give you just a little second here just to make sure that everybody can get here. You know, and I just say, how often do we find ourselves speaking about something important to someone that seems to be not listening? And, um, you know, the thing is that uh, they go on to prove the point that they're not listening because they completely ignore your warning and carry on. And it's a frustrating thing. I reckon that God has that frustration with us sometimes. Mm. You know, because he's always telling us things in his word. It's a frustrating experience. But God wants us not only to hear his word, but also to do or to live, you know, his word also. And it says in uh, James 1 and verse 22, it says, But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You know, it's a deception to think that you can listen to the word without taking responsibility for what you've heard. You know, the word of God changes everyone. Amen. It changes everyone. The minute you come into contact with the word, it changes you. He says, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, what does it say here? He says, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. In other words, he's looking in a mirror here. He says, for he beholdeth himself, he sees himself there, and goes his way, and straight away he forgets what manner of man he was. You know, we just forget ourselves. And it says, and whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Amen. So a blessing in hearing and also doing. Well, let's just commit this to the Lord just now. Lord Jesus, we just thank you, God, for your work. We pray, God, that your blessing would be upon it. Grant each one that portion, Father, and he is to hear what the Spirit says to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Would you love to go to No, did somebody see birthday? Yeah. 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 Who's the oh, last week? Oh. Uh, I'm just trying to catch up. <laughs> trying to catch up. So, what is it that distinguishes a good hearer from a bad hearer? Has everybody got their spiritual ears open here? Amen. Take this, take that nasty, you know, kind of wax out of your ears. You know, that stuff that's not of God. Get that wax out and just begin to listen. Because, you know, we're asking this question, what is it that distinguishes a good hearer from a bad hearer? And the thing is that what it's telling us here, the fact is that this is a story of a man who forgot himself. He looked in the mirror and he recognized himself, and then he walks away and he forgets himself. Now, this is a man with a spiritual amnesia. He can't understand, you know, he can't remember himself at all here. What we notice is that it's even more worse for those that hear and actually understand what's being said. Then there's no follow up, you know, with, you know, putting it into what the hair into action. The thing is that whatever we hear, we always act upon it. And, you know, and I think that that's something that every one of us do. You know, when we hear something, there's always something to do and uh, to put it into practice when it comes to the Word. 
And what we notice is that the problem is not so much the hearing, but it's the doing that's the big problem with us. You know, we just love to hear things. You know, sometimes, you know, people just love to just kind of sit around and just listen to everything that's been said, and then that's it, you know, they kind of go on and do something else. And so it's about getting that connection working between what God is telling you through his word and embracing that thought and turning it into an action. That's what we're speaking about. We're speaking about what, you know, God speaking and then turning it into an action. And the thing is, the fact is that you can act upon the word of God. If you act upon and how you act upon the word of God, it indicates how committed you are to God's love and God's words. See how you act upon it. Now, if I was to say to you something, I'm going to give you a natural example here. Right, for instance, for instance, you get the reminder in for your tax, for your car. Now, the thing is that you can have complete understanding that this is the tax for my car. And I really know about this tax here. But the thing is that if you don't turn that into action, then they will take action against you. You know, and the thing is, if the car the tax that reminder comes in and you don't do anything about it, then you can look forward to a fine and perhaps even your vehicle being impounded because you haven't taken action. And the thing is that when we hear the word of God, sometimes we just don't take action. We know what God says and we know what he's saying. And the thing is, it's, it's not having the information and the understanding that counts here. You know, you can know the Bible inside out, but that doesn't mean a thing unless it translates into action. Amen. You know, we just heard there about how Enoch was translated. You know, we have got to translate what we hear into an action. See? And that's where it really counts, when it becomes an action. Acting upon what you have heard, that's the thing that really counts. You know, Jesus told the people, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, he says, it's time to get out. And those that listened were saved. And those that didn't listen, well, you know, they just took their chances. The thing is, if you hear the word and keep it, God has a blessing. That's what it says there. It says, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, that goes for the sisters as well, so you know what to do. It's for everybody. See? And the thing is, it's a blessing for you. Now, it was said of the, the seeds of the words that were listening to that were scattered, that were told in Luke 18 and verse 15. You know, but that... The seed that fell is speaking about here. He says that fell on good grounds are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, kept it. Amen. And that's the big thing, they kept it. He says, and not only did they keep it, but it says that it brought forth fruit with patience. So the thing is that when you take on the word and you begin to translate that into action, things begin to happen. So you know, things begin to happen. There is no such thing as an inactive Christian. You know, if you're a believer, then God wants you to move in the Spirit, he wants you to move and act upon His words. See, others will follow you. Others will, you know, the thing is that you can lead them into a blessing when you begin to act upon the words. You know, in counterwise, we could say that some people's memories of who they were, you know, are like leaking systems. Because we look back at what we were, you know, how we, we used to praise the Lord in all these wonderful places. We, you know, we were, were kind of walking in these words. You know, and the thing is that, you know, some people's memories are like those that are kind of leaking cisterns or leaking buckets. You know, you can try filling the cistern, you know, but you're losing more than you're filling it. You know, and it's like a patient, you know, losing more blood than you can put in in a transfusion. You know, that is lost. And the thing is that if God brings a blessing, God wants you to be contain that blessing. Amen. See, and how do you contain the blessing? By acting on the words. You've got to act upon it. So what is this man forgotten? Well, the thing is, he's forgotten that he has a relationship with God. Do you know that God has given us a very special relationship with him? You know, it's more than just family. You know, we're here today and we're family. Family in the word. 
But God has given us a special relationship. You know, in First John 3, and we look at verse 1, you know, it was John that says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Now that is love which he has placed upon us. It says it's bestowed upon us. It's not our natural love. It's something that he has placed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. You're a child of God. He says, therefore the world knows us not because it knew not him. He says, and beloved, now this is what we have to remember. This is the thing that the man that was looking in the mirror forgot. He says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. See, this is not something that you have to wait on. We have to remember that now we are a child of God. That never changes. You know, it doesn't matter what your child does. You know, your child can go and rob a bank, you know, or could, you know, look after you and give you, you know, make sure that you've got your dinner every night. And it doesn't matter what they do, they're still your child. Whether they do good or whether they do bad, they're still your child. And it's the same with our relationship with God. We are still a child of God. To so thank the Lord that he's given us a saviour. Because we would never make it without that. Amen. You know, and it says here, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. So we don't know what we're going to be. It says, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Oh my. When he begins to reveal himself, we'll be like him. He says that every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. There is something wonderful about looking for the coming of the Lord. There's something wonderful about setting your, your mind upon you know, the change that's going to come. Because what it does is it purifies you. He it purifies, he purifies himself even as he is pure. You know, in most of our spiritual problems, the, re the root cause is that we have forgotten who we are. A lot of people, you know, are in a lot of trouble. And they go around in circles and they try to sort out their life. But really what it is, is that they've looked in the mirror and then they've walked away and they've forgotten who they are. You've got to remember who you are. And this man forgot quite a number of things. He forgot that he was cleansed. He forgot that he was sanctified and set apart for the master's use all by the blood of Jesus. He forgot these things. He forgot that he was the elect of God before the foundation of the world. You know, and that he had been called into God's service. He forgot these things. You know, when God speaks and we go through the Bible, we might say, well, I've read that passage before. But what God is doing is God is reminding you what you saw in the mirror. He said, look back because this is my word. This is who you are. This is what you identify with. And remember that your calling and election should be a sure thing. You know, when you forget what was in the mirror, you know, all of a sudden you lose that. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, we are told that wherefore the rather brethren he says, give diligence to your calling. He says, and your election sure. He says, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. And remember that your calling is what you do for God. Your election is what God has done for you. He's brought you into his family. You're part of him. See, and the thing is that because, you know, he has done that for us, then our callings, you know, that's entirely up to us what we do about that. If we love God, then we will hear what he has said and we will act upon it. See, for those that are kind of wandering about in spiritual limbo, you know, they might be saying to themselves, how can I get by? Well, I've got a few kind of suggestions for you. To get back, you know, you have to be in the right frame of mind. And you can start looking up these scriptures yourself. It's very anecdotal. I'm just seeing it off the top of my head. But the thing is, you've got to put on the mind of Christ for starters. 
the, a lot of the problems would be solved right there if we just put on the mind of Christ. You know, sometimes you know people have got these little bracelets. What will Jesus do? Or what does Jesus do? That's more to the point, isn't it? See, put on the mind of Christ. If people just put on the mind of Christ, we wouldn't have half the problems in the church that we have. Another thing that we can do if you're wondering about spiritual limbo is that you can get your eyes upon things. You know, if you've got your eyes here, there, and everywhere, you know, you're in a loser right away. You've got to remember who you are. You've got to go back to that mirror. What has God done for me? What has God made me? I might be transformed into his image. See, you've got to look back. You've got to turn your eyes upon Jesus. You've got to get your eyes upon the right thing. You know, the thing is, if you keep on looking at the wrong things, then that's what you become. So you are what you read, you are what you watch, you are what you, you know, what you kind of lend your eyes to. See, but if you lend your eyes to the right thing, then I tell you, your problems will be solved right there. You will be getting yourself back to where you should be, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Another thing you can do to get yourself back as well, you know, is get involved. The, the scriptures actually tell us that two are better than one. And the thing is that sometimes, you know, you, you might find, well, I, I don't know how to get involved by myself. Or maybe it's a big thing. Sometimes people find it really, really hard to do something for God because they are on their own. And they think, well, what difference can I make? What you need to do is you need to get yourself someone to come along with you. Jesus sent the disciples out in twos. There was a reason for that, because two are a lot stronger than one. And if you put your mind to something, if two agree to anything, it shall be done. See, get yourself involved, and if, if it's too frightening to get yourself involved, then get someone else with you. You know, don't try to do it by yourself. You don't have to do it by yourself. You, you don't have to get back by yourself. But there's always help. There's always brothers and sisters. Another thing you can do as well is you can make a conscious effort to get out of your comfort zone. Sometimes we can be so content with where we are. It's an absolute pigsty. It's a mess. You know, and spiritually, it's no good for you. But it's your pigsty. The thing is, you need to get out of that comfort zone. See, and do something for the kingdom of God. You're getting off a quiet one, mate. <laughs> I must be heading home. There must be something good here. Because everybody's quiet. See, get out of your comfort zone and do something for the kingdom of God. And also as well, you can ask your pastor for general guidance. You know, make myself available. You know, and the thing is that you don't have to do it alone. That's what you have. To remember. You know, and the thing is that there are some things that are meant to be together. You know, sometimes you, you can't always do things by, you no, know, there's pancakes and syrup. My goodness, that's a great combination, isn't it? <laughs> great combination. They're meant to be, there's two peas in a pod, and my goodness, they look the same. They're meant to be together. You know, and the thing is that some say that some are born to be athletes. You know, they've, they've got a certain physique and they lend themselves to this particular skill and it's amazing how they take it. Some people are musical and they just they just lend themselves to it and it's amazing what can happen when they get in there. Some people are preachers. You know, once they start preaching, that's it. You know, my goodness, the found of the day. Some people are born to be a mother. Some are born to be a father. You can just see it in them. They haven't got any kids yet, but well, you can see it. See, because some things are meant to be together. You know, and so we can have asked ourselves, well, what's the necessary complement you know, of a believer? If you're a believer, what is the necessary complement? What goes with us? And the thing is that what we have to remember is, and this is from Ephesians 2 and 8, that the believer is made for 
forth the works of God. You pay for it. See? And the thing is, it's part of them, and it always will be part of them. See, the believer is made for the word of God. And the word of God itself says, you know, in verse 8 here, this is Ephesians 2 and verse 8, he says, for by grace you are saved through faith. And you know something? It's not of yourself. You think that you put your hand up and you got saved. That's not the way it works. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. See, God saved you. You didn't save yourself. Your pastor didn't save you. Save you. The evangelist didn't save you. The Lord saved you. That's what you have to remember. You know, and the thing is, he says, he says it's not of works. In other words, you didn't work really hard to get here. You know, and it doesn't matter how, well, I'd rather that you did attend church. I'd rather that you were here. You know, but the thing is, that's not what counts. See, it's what he has done for you. That's the main thing. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, I'm not sticking out my chest and say, I did it. You know, thank you, Lord, I didn't need you today. You know, I didn't need a saviour today because I am so perfect. No, we need the Lord. Amen. Amen. Every time. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. See, for we are his workmanship. See, we are his creation. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. See, that's the necessary complement. See, his word that we have been created by him. And the thing is that the word and the believer are one. We are joined at the hip. We were joined to the word. See, it's like a marriage. See, the bride and the bridegroom. It's a marriage. See, and we're given power to become the children of God. So an example, you know, for, of this, you know, God said to Jeremiah, he says this in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, and he told Jeremiah, Jeremiah was just a little bit worried about facing people. You know, he thought, I can't do this by myself, but you know, two are better than one. When God is with you, you're not on your own. And the Lord said to him, he says, before I formed thee in the belly, that was a long time ago. He says, I knew thee. He says, I knew thee. He says, before thou camest forth out of the room, he says, I sang, he set him apart. He sanctified him. He says, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. See, God has never left the side of the believer. You might feel high and dry at times, but let me tell you something. You know, that is utter unbelief because he never leaves his people. He says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. He says, I'll be with you till the end of the earth. He, God has always been active. You know, as his believers grow in his word, he's always been there. And you know that God has put out a great commitment to us. God is very, very committed to us. No, thank the Lord. He's a, you know, we sing that song, Faithful God. And that's what he is. You know, what a faithful God we serve. And God is committed to us. And you know, number one, I would say this, that God commits to getting your attention. You know, we read in Psalms 91 and verse 15, it says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. He says, I will be with him in trouble. You know, I'll tell you one thing, that sometimes you, you begin to know your friends when you're in trouble. See, you begin to realise who your friends are when you're in trouble. You know, the Lord actually says, call upon me in the time of trouble. He says, I'll deliver you. He says, I will be with him in trouble. He says, I will deliver him and honour him. I tell you, there's some ice in the cake here. And another thing that we can say is, and, you know, God assures us that he knows us personally. Sometimes we think, well, you know, that God is away up in heaven. He, you know, what's he got to do with me? You know, why did he take the time? But God 
knows you. This is what he said to Abraham in Genesis 18 and verse 19. He said of Abraham, he says, for I know him. You know, sometimes we're wondering, you know, does God know who I am? This is what he said to Abraham, he says, for I know him. And not only did he know him, but he also knew about his character. Because this is the character of a believer. He says he will command his children and his household after him. He says, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. He says that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So we can be assured that God's commitment to us is that God assures us that he knows us personally. We can also say, you know, and the thing is, if you did not get what he said the first time, then he will try again. Because sometimes we just try maybe once or twice and that's it. You know, we'll just leave it. But if you're a child of God, God will be on your case. He'll you know, let you know. We read in Job 33, in verse 14, For God spake once, he twice. Yet man perceiveth it not, doesn't see him. He says, in a dream and in a vision in the night, he says, when deep sleep falleth upon men, he says, in the slumberings of their bed, it's then that he opens the ears of men and sealeth their destruction. He, God, no, will get a message over to you if, really, if he really needs to, to do that. He won't forget you. And also we can say, and this is from Isaiah 65, verse 24, that there is not one need that you have that God does not know about. You know, there might be needs that you have that I don't know about. But let me tell you something, God knows your need. He knows what you need. And it said, here in Isaiah 65 and verse 24, he says, And it shall come to pass. In other words, this here is a prophecy. And it will come to pass that before they call, he says, I will answer. He says, And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. See, one thing that we have to remember, we may have a hearing problem, but God does not have a hearing problem. You know, and you're saying, all oh, my prayers have not been answered. There may be a reason for that, because God hears everything. See, God does not have a hearing problem. We have a hearing problem. And also, God is committed to saving us through faith. He is committed, and he's made a way for us. First Peter 1 and verse 3. You know, Paul said that we were blessed. He says, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, according to his abundant mercy, I've begotten us again unto lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, that fadeth not away, preserved in heaven for you. He says, for you who are kept by the power of God. See how he keeps us. Keeps us by the power of God through faith unto salvation. You know, I really do believe that God has saved me. See, and I have faith in that. And so he says, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, and what we can see here is that the fact is that the protection and delivery of his words that God has given us here, that's actually his biggest commitment. You know, God just putting a, a Bible in your hand. You know, when other churches are busy chopping this up and making what they want out of it, you know, and the thing is that if you started, you know, in some of these places, if you started tearing out the, the, the pages of the Bible, you know, you, you wouldn't be left with very much. You know, if it was the bits that they disagreed with, and you could put a black pen through it, there'd be nothing left you know, in some of these places. But one thing that we have to remember is that God has protected his words. 
support, protection, and delivery of his work to us is the biggest commitment that God has towards us to make sure that we have the word. My goodness, we live in a time when there's a famine in the land, and it's not for bread and for butter and stuff like that. It's for the hearing of the word. The hearing of the word. It's not even just the word of God itself. Plenty of Bibles about, plenty of versions about, but that's not the problem. It's the hearing of the word that is the big problem. So God is committed, you know, to you know, to make sure that his word is protected. You know, and the fact is that God's light and his word never goes out. You see a little kind of snippet of this or an example found in Leviticus 24. <coughs> and God said of that light, you know, and of course we have to remember that Jesus is the light for us. <coughs> He says, the Lord speak unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel. This is 24, verse 1. He says that he says to bring the pure oil, uh, pure oil olive beaten for the light. So in other words, that Holy Ghost oil was to be beaten down. And it was to be beaten down to cause the light. He says to cause the lamps to burn continually. You know, that is just an example of what God has done right through history. He has protected his work. That light has never gone out. He says, cause the lamps to burn continually. He says, without the veil of the testimony. In other words, just outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually, and it shall be a statute forever in your generations. You know, and I tell you that without a light of the word, we are absolutely lost. Absolutely lost without the light of the word. We are sunk. See, the light never goes out. You know, my goodness, you know, our, our understanding might differ sometimes. But I tell you that the light of the word never goes out. Amen. Never does go out. It's always the same. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. And God's word, you know, is the light that we walk in. Well, of course, that takes us to first John 1, doesn't it? 6 and 7. You know, as John said, he says that if we walk, he says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we do not the truth. He says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, the light that's provided for us, if we walk in that light, in other words, if you, if you take that word and make it into action, he says, walk in the light as he is in the light. He says, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Oh my we just need to walk in the light. Amen. And that's how the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. When we're in that light, walking in the light that God has given us. So why is God's word so important to us? You know, some times people ask these, these questions. And the thing is that God's word, you know, is food for our souls. You know, it's like a seed sown. Now this is what Jeremiah said about it. You know, the thing is, do you believe that God's word is good enough to eat? <laughs> I believe that God's word is good enough to eat. That's why in Jeremiah 13, verse 16, it was Jeremiah that said, he says, thy words were found. You know, I'll tell you one thing. Have you found the word of God? Yeah. Amen. Have you got a Bible with you? Yeah. I'm not trying to get too personal, but I'm just asking you know, thy words were found, and I did eat them. He says, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. What is the word of God to you? Is it the joy and rejoicing of your heart? Is that what it does for you? Because that's what the word of God is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you joy in your heart. He says, for I am called by thy name. And that's, the, that's really what it's all about. It's being called by his name. O Lord God of hosts. And so these words, what can we say about these words? These words are treasures found. But when we hear that word, 
you know, we can put it into action. And it's like a treasure that's been buried. It can change everything. See, in Jeremiah 8, those words, it was a big buffet feast. Then we you like a buffet. Amen. We love a buffet feast. Well, this is a spiritual buffet. You try a bit of this and you try a bit of that. Do you know something? It's all delicious. The Word of God is absolutely delicious. And not only that, there's a big sign right at the you know, just as you walk in the door that says, eat as much as you want. <laughs> you should get a big sign, you know, as people are coming into church, eat as much as you want. Amen. It's a spiritual buffet feast that we have here. You know, and the thing that is that, you know, John the Revelator, as we're singing about sometimes, you know, he represents the bride of Christ we find in the scriptures. Revelation 10 and verse 8. You know, uh, this is where John speaks about eating the word. And it says, And the voice which I heard from heaven speak unto me again, and says, Go and take the little book in, uh, that is open in the hand of the angel that standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And he says, And when he went unto the angel, says to him, He says, Give me the little book. And I tell you one thing, that we've got a little book here to eat. Amen. Have you got your napkin on? <laughs> Got your knife and fork, you're all ready. You've got your silver platter, you know, kind of right in front of you here. Amen. Redemption. Amen. You know, and it says here, it says, and he gives, he says, and he said to the angel, he says to him, he says, Give me a little book. And it says, and he said unto me, he says, Take it and eat it up. See, so, is, so we find that John had a feast here, and he says, and it shall be. In thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey. And he says, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he says unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Have you noticed there that after eating, there's an action? After eating, is action. He says, I want you to eat that up. No, I want you to listen to the word because there's action after that. And when John ate that word, there was action because he says, You must prophesy again before many peoples. He says, And nations and tongues and kings, it's a blessing to be shared. See? You know, and the thing is that every encounter with God's word is a feast to the believer. Oh, we're feasting well today. And so what's this book all about? He says, take the book. What's this book all about? This book is the word of God. It's for the cleansing of the nations, but it's also for our personal cleansing as well. We take it to the nations, but for ourselves, it's good for us as well. You know, we read here in Psalms, you know, 119 and verse 9. But it tells you here, and it's asking a question. I love it when the, when the scripture asks you a question. You know, God doesn't ask many rhetorical questions. You know, there's, there's always got to be some sort of answer to it. He says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? See, and it's a big question, even today, you know, people are, you know, governments are asking, education is asking, you know, how do we manage to cleanse their way? And I tell you, they have not a clue how to do this. And it says here, by taking heed there to according to thy word. In other words, listening to the word. He says, there to according to the word. And you know, and this is just a simple answer to the cleansing question. You just need to listen to the word. Not only listen to it, but take action on that word. He says, with my whole heart I sought thee. He says, let me not wander, wander from thy commandments. I don't want to be wandering here and wandering there. I want to be right there in the word. He says, thy word I have hid in my heart. I'll tell you one thing, when people are searching searching you out and saying, is this person really a Christian? 
They'll never find it because it's right there in the heart. They have to dig really deep. Because thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, he says, teach me thy statutes. The fact is that this word, the word of God, is not a sticky plaster. It's not a band-aid. You know, sometimes people treat this word like a band-aid. You know, and, and it's, it's more than that. You know, this word of God is the ultimate spiritual vaccine against sin. You know, forget about the COVID. This here is the ultimate spiritual vaccine against sin. That's what this word is. We are with shall a man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy words. You know, and not only is the word of God a vaccine, but it's also a spiritual, a supernatural defibrillator. You want a defibrillator this, don't you? This thing you put in your heart. <laughs> I was dead there a minute ago. I'm okay now. It's a supernatural defibrillator. You know, and that's what that's how David recognized it. He might not have known what a defibrillator was back then, but he could say, Well, they not revive us again. That is Psalm 85, 6 and 7. He says, Well, they know not revive us again. He says, At thy he says, that thy people may rejoice in thee, surely. He says, show us mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And Habakkuk, he also, you know, sought a revival as well. He was looking for that supernatural defibrillator. He, and he says here in Habakkuk 3 and verse 1, he says, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, you know, upon uh, Shigar North, I think it is, he says, he says, O oh Lord, he says, I have heard thy speech. He says, and was afraid. He says, O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known and hath remember mercy. And so he was looking for a revival. And so it's a supernatural defibrillator that can revive you. And I tell you one thing, the person who really, really did appreciate that, of course, was Lazarus. See, we read here in John 11 and verse 43, he found the spiritual defibrillator was God's words. Because it says here, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. That was the word of God to Lazarus. Do you know something? He heard it from beyond the grave and he acted on it. Isn't that amazing? So don't tell me that you're too far gone to the act on the words. Because if Lazarus can do it, you can do it. You're still alive. See, Lazarus come forth, and when he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, she was bound hand and foot. Sometimes, sometimes we think we're in such a, a fix that we can't hear the word of God. We can't do anything about it. He says, bound hand and foot in grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus says unto him, loose him and let him go. Because he's got things to do. <laughs> See, that word brought Lazarus to life. Now, do you think that that changed me? Did the word of God change Lazarus? Now, I'll tell you one thing. If the word of God can change a dead man, what can it do for you? Change you. See, God can change you. Yeah, you're a mighty client. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and also as well, you know, this word of God is like a fire. You know, when that word of God comes to us and we hear it, it's like a fire in the nose. Because we, we read about this, you know, the thing is that we read about this in Jeremiah 23. So in God's words like a fire, and the thing is that what that fire does is that tears down the strongholds. We'll talk about a bit, a bit about strongholds as we go through this. You know, and strongholds are like our little personal pockets of resistance that ensnares us. That keeps us, you know, away from the mirror. We forget who we are. 
And then Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Now God said to Jeremiah, Is not my word like a fire? But he began to realize, Yeah, your word, O oh Lord, is like a fire. He says, Say the Lord, this is like a hammer. He says, That breaks the rock in pieces. You know, I'll tell you one thing in a time of the Bible, when the fires are there, the rocks explode. They do. He says, wherefore, he says, behold, he says, I'm against the prophets, saith the Lord. He says, that steal words, everyone from this neighbor. You know, just going about saying what they, you know, what they hear, itching ears. You know, the thing is, if you're going to listen to anything, make sure that you're listening to the words. See? And he says, and behold, he says, I'm against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. He says, and I'm against them that Prophesy false dreams. You're telling these riveting stories to entertain you, to keep you on the edge of your seat, saith the Lord. He says, and do tell them. He says, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. See, likeness, like being very cavalier about it. Don't even think about the consequences of what you're saying. He says, and I have sent them not, he says, neither commanded them. He says, therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Now, one thing that we know is that the scriptural words that we hear is a revival fire. You know, it's just sweeping through the camp. What it does is it puts us to action. I tell you one thing, if there's a fire in here, there'd be action. You know, people would be running about. Yeah, there'd be people grabbing these, you know, these fire hydrants, and they'd be busy reading it. Now, you're supposed to read the word before the disaster starts. You know, and this is what happened. People were reading the, you know, the instructions, you know, to find out what to do. But whenever there's a fire, there's always a reaction. See, and that's when the revival fires come, there should always be a reaction. See, and the thing is that God's word you know, tears down our strongholds. That's why God sends the Bible fires. Tearing down our strongholds and gets us back safely into Him. We've got to go back to Christ every time. Second Corinthians 10 and verse 3. Now, it tells us here that for though we walk in the flesh, you know, we do not walk war in the flesh. So our battle is not with the flesh and blood. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not normal, it's not the natural stuff. He says, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See, strongholds are something that has to be pulled down. See, little personal pockets of resistance that ensnare us. See, we've got to make way for the revival fires, casting down your imaginations. He says, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, to the obedience of his word. He says, and having an all readiness to revenge, no, also to revenge all disobedience. He says, when your obedience is fulfilled. See, wonderful. See, so we're a hearer of the word. A little bit more than spiritual strongholds. A spiritual stronghold is a habitual pattern of thought that determines your worldview. So how you see the world, you know, might be your stronghold. See, and that's the thing that has to be tackled. It says that determines our worldview. It can be an er erroneous teaching that takes root. That will not budge even when the truth is presented. You know, and the fact is that Satan wants to capture the minds of the sons of God. For the mind is the fortress of the soul. And he who controls the mind has the person under their control. So these strongholds have to be broken down. That's the reason why we need the Bible fires. That's the reason why we need to have a reason for opening up the Word of God. Not only hearing it, but acting upon it. 
You know, I would like these all to act upon the words. You know, and the thing is, I would, I would, I would do a challenge out to you actually. You know, next week, invite somebody along. You know, if, even if they're not a Christian, invite them along. You know, we're not trying to grab people from other churches. You know, what's the point of doing that? That's not, that's not church, that's church enlargement. It's not church growth. You know, church enlargement is you bring people from one fellowship to your fellowship. That's enlargement. Church growth is when you get people who are unsaved and bring them to the Lord and bring them in the presence of God that they might recognize Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's church growth. You know, invite somebody to church. You know, and bring them along. I put that as a challenge to you. You know, act upon the words. See, and the Lord too, you know, can make use of his strongholds in our minds. I want this word of God to be a stronghold. I want this to be, you know, so ingrained in us, you know, that, you know, it just becomes a mighty stronghold, you know, a power, a force, you know, to drive us forward. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 7, the fact is that the word of God, you know, is our wake-up call. You know, for Jeremiah, I have to say that this was an inconvenient truth. You know, not everybody receives the word of God with gladness, even if they're believers. And here's an example here, because we find Jeremiah, he's not terribly happy about the word of God coming to him. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with questioning things. There's nothing wrong with, you know, perhaps a little bit of reticence or complaining. As long as you take it through. See, and this is what Jeremiah says, it's, and it's in Jeremiah 20 and verse 7, he says, Oh Lord, he says, thou hast deceived me. That's a great way to, to start a conversation with God, isn't it? You know, accusing him of deception. You have deceived me. So I'll tell you one thing, God has deceived us all. In this sense, according to this word. He says, thou hast deceived me. He says, I was deceived. He says, and thou art stronger than I. You know, the big, you know, kind of thing was that God knew who Jeremiah was. And he knew what he would do with the words. And he put it in his lap and says, what are you going to do with it? And you know, Jeremiah heard the words and he took action. He couldn't help himself because he loved God so much. And he says, you know something? You've deceived. Now, you ever had somebody twist your arm off the back, off your back? You know, and get you to do something that you didn't want to do, but you enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> That's what God was doing with Jeremiah. He says, you're not liking this, but I tell you, this is going to have a great effect. This is going to be great for your walk. You know, this is going to save many people. You might not like it at the time, but oh, this is what's going to happen. He says, thou hast deceived me. He says, I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I he says, and has prevailed. He says, I am a derision daily. In other words, people make fun of him. He says, everyone mocketh me. His reputation was in absolute tatters. Absolute tatters. He says, for since I speak, he says, and cried out, he says, I cry violence and spoil. That's what was, what was happening to him. He says, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me. He says, and the direction daily. In other words, you know, Jeremiah's sitting back here and says, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. How many times have you been, you know, is God taking you through something and you're saying, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. Well, Jeremiah felt exactly the same. It's not fair. He says, then I said, he says, I will not make mention of him. <laughs> That's the easy thing to do. Let's not say anything. Let's just sit on it and not tell anybody. No, I tell you, life would be an absolute breeze if we didn't have to tell anybody about what God was doing in our heart. See, he says, I will not make mention of him. Don't speak any more than his name. He says, but his word in my heart was burning, was as a burning fire in my bones. You know, there comes a point where you've just got to do something. You can't sit on it anymore. You've got
got to get up out of your comfort zone and act upon the words. He says, I was weary with forbearing. In other words, he was hanging back and hanging back. He had to do something. He says, I was weary with forbearing. He says, and I could not stay. See, who would want this life? You know, it'd be easier just to sit back and say nothing, but Jeremiah claims, no, you deceive me. He says, you know that I cannot deny this word. My heart is in fire with the loving glory of God. And so he broke down a stronghold and got out there and just told them exactly what they needed to hear. See, God's word in us is God's stronghold. So strongholds are not always bad. You know, if it's God's word, that's a great stronghold to have. I hope that they're all got a stronghold. You know, even to the point they're saying, God, you deceived me. But I'm going to carry on anyway. I'm going to act upon the words. And the thing is that if we hear the word and live it, become a doer, you know, we have peace with God. Isaiah recognized this in Isaiah 48 and verse 17. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shalt go, and thou hast hearkened unto my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. See, what we notice here is that peace like a river, that's your reward for hearing the word and then living it, acting it out. You know, and the thing is that we're plunged into the depths. You know, having been, you know, having been given a deep understanding of his righteousness. That's what Isaiah is saying. You've hearkened to my commandments, then you have peace in the river and thy righteousness as waves in the sea. The thing is that God wants us to hear his words because, and this is simply the reason, God wants you to hear his words because there are no other higher words. It doesn't matter that there's no man or anybody that, can, that has higher words than what is given us here. This is his words. You know, and the thing is, we read this in Isaiah 8 and verse 20, which says to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, if you make it up as you go along, then I tell you, his light is not in you. He says, you know, so the thing is, if you want light, does everybody, everybody want light? Amen. Well, you speak his words. You act upon his word. So that's how to do it. And also as well, God's word is his absolute. In other words, there is no higher authority than the word of God. No higher authority. You know, and, well, I tell you, you know, people say, well, you know, I've got this and I've got that. There is no higher authority than the word of God. You know, and the thing is that Jesus states this warning in regard to his word in Revelation 22 and verse 18. He says, if any man shall take away from the words of this book, he says, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. He says, and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy. So in hearing the words of the prophecy, he says, of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto them the plagues that are written in this book. In other words, you cannot pick and choose what you want from the word of God. It is all or nothing. And you certainly don't add or subtract from it. It is all or nothing. You know, and the fact is that in the New Testament, God has only one way of communicating with us. We read this in Hebrews 1 and verse 1. And it tells us that God, who in sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these days spoken unto us by his Son. Amen. What is his Son? That's the Word of God. 
He says, by whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So in other words, you know, that everything has to agree with this word. You know, whether it be a prophet, whether it be a priest, whether it be a pastor, whether it be an evangelist, a teacher, you know, uh, whatever, you know, it's got to agree with what the word of God says in the first place. God has no other way of communicating with us, only through his word. And, you know, the thing is that all God asks us to do when we hear his word is just to believe. That's all it is. Just believe. It's very, very simple. I hope that you don't think that would be too complicated today. Is this a complicated message? No. It's, it's pretty simple. Straightforward. You know, you hear the word and you act upon it. It's just as simple as that. The Bible says, what saith the scripture? And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. At Romans 4 and verse 3. And my last page here. So it's the simple believer desires only one thing. Now 1 Peter 2 and verse 1 you know, says it like this. Therefore, laying aside all malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, and evil speaking, you know something, you can just throw them out. That's trash can stuff. Get rid of it. And it says here that as a believer, a new, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world. That's all we desire, it's just the sincere milk of the word they grow thereby. He says, if so, he says, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You know, it's not to make the word of God complicated. The, the thing about the word of God is that even a child should understand it. You know, we've got young people here today, you know, listening in, you know, listening to the word. And the thing is that even a child should be able to understand this. A child, a child shall not hear here in. You know, it's pretty simple. You know, you hear the word and you act on it. It's just as simple as that. And God's desire is just to protect us. You know, if we would just let him do this. You know, this was Jesus when he came to Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem's under a lot of fire just now. A lot of things happening over there. Uh, and in Matthew 23, verse 37, you know, Jesus probably seen things that were to come. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he says, Thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, he says, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her ch chickens under her wings? He says, And you would not. See, God's greatest desire is just to protect us. You know, if we'll just let him do that. If we'll just hear the word and do what he says, if we'll just hear that word and, and make it, you know, an action, you know, then God is there to protect us. You know, and the fact is that whether we be a hearer or whether we be a doer or whether we be both, you know, what we have to remember is that it's all about Jesus. The glory always goes to God. You know, I don't just say, well, you know, I've heard the word and I'm going to do this. You know, it's by God's grace that I perform this work. It's by God's grace. It's nothing to do with me as such. All the glory goes to him. And that's why we're told to you in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 that if any man be in Christ, what is he? He is a new creature. And all things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So let us be hearers and doers of his words. Not just hearers, you know, get that wax out of your ear, that spiritual wax, get those things out of your ears. And let's be not just hearers, but also doers. Let's take it to action. Let's have action upon the word. And let the word become flesh in our lives. Let us just live out that word. Living out the word is taking action. See, the word became flesh in the bottom of us. Let's just do that. So let's just commit this to the Lord's now.
Warden is trying to find the body. That's a wonderful thing in your places, Lord. The brought us to hear your word, Lord God, and you've spoken to our hearts. Lord, we pray, Father God, the things that we have heard today, Father, may it not just be something that just goes over the top of our head, or just like that man who looked in the mirror and walked away and forgot what he was looking at. Let us just remember that we are a child of God and what you have raised us up for, that you have made us manifest in this time, Father. Lord, manifested for good works, Father. And we pray, Father, that may, Lord, we glorify you in our lives. Lord, let it not just stop at just a walk of hair, Father, but Lord, let us become the doers of your word also, Father, we pray. So we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.